Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Jan Peter Muller, who's come across to us from uh, from London, uh, and he's visiting here in California and has been working up at Devon Island with uh, SETI Institute's Pascal Lee. Uh, Jan Peter did his uh, bachelor's in physics at uh, Sheffield, uh, and then uh, did a master's at Imperial College on uh, atmospheric physics and dynamics and then did his PhD in planetary uh, meteorology and astronomy uh, at University College London. He is uh, an imaging expert and lead, uh, lead of the uh, imaging team at UCL and he has been a team member of MODIS and MISER on uh, Earth, on satellite uh, observations of the Earth. Uh, and then he's also worked on Mars uh, uh, instruments, including the HRSC as a team member, that's uh, high resolution stereo uh, camera, which is uh, on uh, Mars Express, and uh, oh, he's also a member of the Stereo PanCam team for ExoMars 2016. Uh, he's the founder of, of uh, Blue Sky Imaging Limited, and uh, he teaches at the Department of uh, Space and Climate Physics at uh, UCL. His interests are, as we're going to hear about, a climate, uh, global climate from Earth observations, uh, fluorescent spectroscopy for life detection. 3D extraction uh, and machine vision. So please join me in welcoming Jan, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian, for those kind words of introduction. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Again, apologies for our late arrival and uh, the technical problems that we've had. So over the next um, hour or less, uh, I'm going to try and describe some of the work that we do at UCL in the Mollard Space Science Laboratory. I'm going to describe who UCL is because I'm sure you probably know who UCL A is, but probably not <laughs> UCL. Um, and um, I'm also going to uh, give you a little insight into what goes on in the old country across the, across the large pond. Um, before I uh, demolish the uh, microphone. So. Uh, my talk is going to cover um, who we are and what the laboratory I come from does. Um, and then I'm going to define what it is that I mean by life. Clearly, here I am in the world famous institute which searches for uh, intelligence. Uh, that's not what I'm going to be searching for, uh, as I hope to explain shortly. And then I'm going to show you how 3D information from space, from ground level views, uh, and fusing together for the first time views from space with those from ground level views, or synthesizing views at ground level from space borne views, um, and show you some open source tools that we've developed uh, that allows anyone uh, from the public uh, or the scientific community to make their own 3D analysis of ground level views or space views. Then I'm going to show you some examples of how we go about uh, doing hyperspectral uh, imaging and also what on Earth hyperspectral might mean, um, <coughs> both from space and from ground level, how we do fluorescent imaging, uh, in particular in this particular case looking for life, and then about a promise of the future, how we might be able to uh, develop that device that we all know so well since the 1960s that took place on USS Enterprise that allows us to detect life on surfaces. Uh, but we have another version of that called isotopologues that we're going to discuss. And then how we bring all of this information together into one unified uh, geospatial framework in order to be able to do um, data analysis of data now, of course, from MSL Curiosity and land up with a few challenges and opportunities for the future. So. University College London uh, was Sunday Times University of the Year eight years ago. I'm not sure that's like saying that restaurant guide uh, was in the guide eight years ago. Anyway, um, it is in the top five universities. Uh, our main competitors in the UK are Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, and Manchester universities. Um, we're quite a large uh, university in UK terms, pretty tiny in comparison to Stanford or... Uh, uh, UC Berkeley, um, but we have some 19,000 students a year, and uh, we have at the moment two international campuses, one of which is going to play a very important role in the long term, 
uh, based in Adelaide, a school of energy and uh, mineral resources, uh, where MSSL is building a new institute uh, to develop uh, space-borne instruments for the future. So uh, I'm out in the uh, English countryside in a country manor house, not quite in the grand style of Harry Potter, but you know, a bit smaller than that. But anyway, it's a small country house, uh, and uh, it was originally bought by one of the Guinness family before, unfortunately, the family went to pot in uh, metaphorical and literal ways. And um, in <laughs> 1967, um, uh, we bought as an institution uh, this particular site. We're located about 30 miles due south of London. Uh, our main campus is right in the center of London City. We're about 50 miles from the airport. And members of the department are mainly focused on research and postgraduate supervision. So, Sir Harry Massey was the founder of space science in the UK. Uh, he was one of the first people to go into Pernambuco uh, when the V2 rockets um, uh, launch facility uh, was uncovered, um, and he immediately recognised the potential of using rocketry uh, for doing upper atmospheric sounding and also, in particular, for looking at charged particles. And in 1965, Mullard Limited, uh, that nobody's ever heard of since. Um, made a, a large uh, tax write-off donation to UCL uh, to establish the laboratory. And um, the first director uh, was called Sir Robert Boyd, who also was a key figure in space science. So since uh, the time of establishment in 67, we participated in 35 satellite missions and over 200 rocket experiments. We're also known as UCL's Department of Space and Climate Physics, and we are uh, Britain's largest university-based space research group. So Mullard uh, made valves, and there is a rump left of Mullard that still make valves. All the best uh, rock amplifiers uh, have one of those valves in them. Uh, <coughs> and they did make a, a great deal of money until, of course, Silicon Valley destroyed the valve business. But, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, MSSL has a staff of about 150, uh, and um, we, have about, we have 18 academic staff, and shows you the rest of it. Um, so, we're involved uh, <coughs> at the moment in 19 instruments on 13 different spacecraft. Most of the laboratory is dedicated to astrophysics and space science. Um, uh, there is a large plasma group, uh, a much smaller planetary science group, and I lead the imaging group. And um, what is underlined here are those things that are, uh, in fact, um, planetary missions. And in particular, I want to point out to uh, the missions of Gaia, uh, which is uh, looking for um, planets and also extra solar planets, of course, uh, and the ExoMars program. Uh, and in the future, we we'll also have several other programs, uh, including... Plato and Euclid uh, for looking for extrasolar planets. These are European Space Agency. So that tells you a little bit about where I come from. Um, and uh, now let's get to the actual topic of the lecture. So what do I mean by life? Uh, clearly, I don't mean intelligence. Uh, I do mean some form of self-replication, some determination to survive uh, irrespective of what the environmental conditions are, and to be able to adapt to those environmental conditions. And uh, the only way I'm going to be able to search for these uh, life fragments uh, is clearly um, if I know what I'm looking for. And therefore, I'm going to make the assumption that what I find on another planet is similar to what I find on the Earth. I have no other way of actually doing that, because at this point in time, I can't write down the equivalent uh, of... Um, electromagnetic Maxwell equation uh, or some weak uh, force interaction equation that allows me from theoretical grounds to say how the chemistry works together with the physics in order to produce life. So until I can do that, I really have no choice, but I have to use terrestrial life forms as a basis for doing this interpretation. So I'm going to be looking for a microbial life, and in particular, I'm going to be looking for it uh, just underneath the surface of rocks called, uh, so it's inside rocks, they're called endolithic, 
uh, microbes, or I'm going to make the assumption uh, that the life itself doesn't necessarily require um, sunlight, uh, but is able to survive in conditions underneath the surface, because we know we've discovered such things on the Earth that it can be as far away as one kilometer below the surface. In addition, uh, I'm also going to look for life which might be in uh, overhangs of cliffs. And the reason why that's pretty important is uh, it minimizes the chance that harmful UV radiation will actually destroy uh, the DNA in particular. Um, or I'm going to look in cave entrances where I can get diffuse light coming from the outside. Now, extreme files on the Earth have also been found uh, in ice called cryoconites. Um, and uh, these have been studied quite extensively recently in a number of different field campaigns. But one characteristic they all have in common uh, at this point in time, although there is life uh, that uh, doesn't require uh, oxygen at all, uh, pretty well all life as we know it on the Earth requires water. And so what I'm going to be looking for is places where there have been water, usually standing water, standing for some considerable time in order for the mineral physics and the chemistry to work together potentially to generate the starting points of those microbes. So there are extensive examples on terrestrial sites, one of those being the Houghton Mars project I'm sure you've heard about from Pascal Lee, Kira and others, um, in Schumacher Oasis looking at cryoconites. So What's different about this? Well, I'm not going to be using the typical tools of biology for looking for this life, because I want to be able to tell where the life is remotely. Now, ideally, I'd like to be able to do it from space. I mean, we already do it today. We have Earth observation instruments in space uh, that look at vegetation. Um, a few of those have high enough resolution now to also look at large biological forms, elephants example. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I'm going to be looking for microbes. So I can test some of this to see whether or not I can detect uh, microbial uh, outbreaks in ice or in desert regions. I can't look for microbes in vegetation. I'm going to do that both on the basis of uh, working with geologists who can look at these pictures and 3D models and say, aha, I can see the characteristic signs that tell that there has been standing water in this region. And I can also make measurements from the 3D shape and compare those measurements with theory and say that this particular region uh, is likely to have had standing water. I I'm going to use the color uh, and a very, very fine way of looking at the color, at the spectral imaging, to detect specific minerals that are associated with standing water or the action of water uh, on mineral salts. And if I'm really lucky, uh, I might even detect something that uh, might have chlorophyll in it. Pretty unlikely from space, but not necessarily so unlikely uh, in a cliff overhang or a cave entrance or buried beneath the surface. Um, and another version of chlorophyll, which forms part of the same story of photosynthesis, is called phycocyan. That's another thing that has a particular characteristic fluorescence. Now, microorganisms exist in very harsh environments on the Earth. In Antarctica, they exist, and they're covered with this uh, scitonemin, which I can never pronounce properly. Um, <coughs> and basically, this is really tough, resistant material uh, against uh, UV radiation damage. And we found bugs uh, that can survive inside nuclear reactors. Uh, they, in fact, were also found in Johnson Space Flight Center in their clean room. Um, and we found bugs uh, that will be able to exist at 600 degrees Celsius. But we've not yet found any bugs that survive deep UV damage. So this is the one thing that life as we know it uh, cannot survive against. So any place that is going to have a lot of UV, it's unlikely that we're actually going to be able to detect them. Then I'm not going to talk very much about uh, organic materials, but uh, there's a lot of organic materials in the universe. So I'm going to also look at uh, fluorescence 
And in particular, I'm going to look at features in the UV uh, because of the fact that uh, in order to fight against the UV, uh, <coughs> cells will produce, or pigments in the cells will produce, uh, a characteristic fluorescence. Then another way of looking for life is to look at signatures of life byproducts. And one of the life byproducts of termites, for example, as well as uh, cyanobacteria, uh, is gas, methane gas in particular. And being able to tell methane gas that comes from a bug in comparison to methane gas uh, that comes out of a hole in the ground uh, from some geological process that's taken tens or hundreds of millions of years, um, you can do that nowadays by looking at isotopes of carbon-12 and carbon-13. And you can measure those isotopes using fantastically fine spectral resolution, now down the, the order of a hundredth of a nanometer. So finally, uh, putting all this stuff together in one environment. So I'm going to go through uh, these different areas and show you some examples. So we're going to start off first with 3D uh, knowledge and acknowledge my uh, postdoc uh, co-workers and software engineer. Uh, <coughs> and we're going to start first with uh, an instrument called the HRC, High Resolution Stereo Camera, uh, and the SRC, which is supposedly the Super Resolution uh, Camera. This is still flying on the European Space Agency's Mars Express mission. Uh, which was launched in 2003 um, and has been uh, operating pretty well non-stop since then. And one of the key differences between this camera and all the cameras that have flown on US NASA platforms and also on other various nations uh, is the fact that from the very beginning it was decided that this would be a stereo mapping instrument. This would be capable of obtaining 3D. Not 3D as a byproduct, which is what, for example, High Rise does uh, <coughs> or Mock did before, but 3D from the very beginning. So what that means is, uh, in addition to having a nadir instrument and the uh, uh, SRC, you have off nadir, and in fact you have nine of these all together, which form a cluster in the order of plus or minus uh, 19 degrees. And you can use the fact that you're looking at the surface from different angles in order to reconstruct a three-dimensional shape. And so we've developed, uh, as well as our colleagues in the German Space Agency, which is called DLR, um, a method of doing this. And this shows you the... from laser altimetry, which is on the order of four kilometers apart uh, of the equator. Now, compare that with the Earth. Uh, this was released uh, only recently, last November. Uh, <coughs> this is a Japanese-American instrument called ASTA. And the Global Digital Elevation Model, which is at th 30 meters, is available. But you can see the coverage isn't actually very good over uh, the poles, but is pretty good everywhere else. So. The land surface of Mars is 147 million square kilometers, and the land surface uh, of the Earth is 149. So they're about comparable in size. So um, using 3D uh, automated you can see a colorized version of height of the models, and you can recognize what looks like uh, a riverbed system. We're going to be looking at this uh, in 3D uh, in a moment. And on the right is the corresponding image. Uh, it consists of five individual strips of image. This also consists of five individual uh, 3D models. And um, using these models, uh, it's possible to uh, clearly reconstruct the surface. And what we're looking at here is an area uh, where we've seen extensive flooding. Flooding, uh, which when the initial analysis was done with uh, Mars data from the 1990s, indicated that Mars had the capability of 100 times more water 
or gushing out of the surface. But that was before we had the, uh, the actual 3D information that allowed us to look at five different episodes that took place over half a billion years. Uh, and um, so this uh, 3D model allows you to uh, look for characteristic patterns uh, within the features around. This area is very interesting. This is the big crater feature you might have noticed in the previous picture uh, because it's a place where hematite is formed. And hematite is formed, hematite is a version of iron oxide, only in standing water. It's a huge uh, basin of several hundred kilometers across. So, um, and this is only a low resolution uh, that is also available online on lifeonmars.org. Uh, so another example of standing water on Mars, um, uh, and this is very controversial. Uh, there's a view in Europe, and then there's a different view in North America. I have to acknowledge the fact that uh, there are differences about the interpretation. Um, and this is an area uh, which is not too far away from where MSL Curiosity has just landed. It's called Elysium Planitia. Uh, there's a variation of height of the order of 10 meters over a distance of 1,000 kilometers. So it's very, very flat uh, area. And uh, the first pictures from uh, HRSC uh, indicated uh, these large so-called platy-like features. And the controversy is about what is the interpretation of this. In our nature paper, uh, we interpreted these as fossilized pack ice. So from a large standing body of water, uh, this is what was left over. And what we see here, the differences between those areas where the pack ice formed with ash on top and those areas between uh, where the water has since sublimated. And <coughs> part of the reason for our conclusion uh, is based upon the shape, on the geomorphology. Here's an example of the shape uh, of one of these uh, crater-like features. Uh, and this is a corresponding feature of an oil platform in the Beaufort Sea in the Arctic Circle. Uh, <coughs> and you can see this pileup of material. Uh, the characteristics of the pileup uh, is very, very similar. So the alternative theory says these platy features are lava. But a particular type of lava we don't find anywhere but Mars. Very, very um, liquid, very low viscosity lava. Uh, we don't find it on the Earth, so we find it a bit difficult to interpret it in that way. But it is one way of interpreting it. So here you can see another example in a different place, the Weddell Sea, uh, of features which look very, very similar to uh, these features. And like a jigsaw puzzle, we can fit together these features, you know, indicating they have broken apart from each other. Now, by making three-dimensional measurements with a stereo from the HRSC, it's possible uh, to actually um, measure uh, the equivalent depth uh, that this C once had. And our interpretation is that it is some 45 meters in depth. And there must have been a body of standing water long enough for pack ice to have formed. So that's two different examples, one of catastrophic flooding uh, and the other one of um, this pack ice. Now let's have a look what we find at higher resolutions. So subsequent to the development of the system for uh, HRSC, uh, we've applied the technology and developed it further. But it works with a US instrument called the context camera. Uh, and also the high-rise camera, which both fly on NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and allows us to produce down to the order of a meter in 3D uh, information in terms of its horizontal spacing. Uh, and this allows us then to look at uh, features, and what we can see here is bedding. So we see what looks like sedimentary layers. Now, they might not be sediments as we know it, because sediments come out of water, of course. They're laid down with sand uh, of various different kinds. These sediments could be ash that are deposited on top of each other. There's no unique uh, um, interpretation of this. But by combining the 3D information uh, from the low resolution from HRC with the fine resolution that we can get out of high rise, it allows us to make measurements of the bedding itself. And look for characteristic features that we see on the Earth 
associated with sediments. So much so that you can now take your Google Earth, uh, zoom down into various different parts of Google Earth, and do the corresponding thing, albeit you can't zoom down into the 3D versions of high-rise, but uh, that's only a matter of time. Uh, and here you can look for analogs between that that you can see on the surface of Mars at the appropriate angles and scales, and the corresponding features, same kind of erosional features, that you can see on the surface of the Earth. So it allows you to explore that in a much more um, quantitative way than before. And taking this one stage further, uh, we've published some work of, uh, a couple of years back about uh, different environments on Mars uh, called thermocast lakes. These are well known in Arctic regions uh, as a result of collapse of permafrost. And what we found in particular is there are channels between these individual uh, thermocast lake uh, like features. Um, and from that, it's been possible to derive quite a lot of information about how long the water was there and how long it took to actually make those erosions. Now, the first place I showed you uh, was called Aris Vallis, that big valley that we flew around. And along the side of uh, Aris Vallis, we have a whole variety of these thermocast lakes with crater features which have so called polygons in the in the bottom of them, and polygons on the Earth form as a result uh, in permafrost region. So this is a schematic, this is an actual picture of 3D, uh, but this is a schematic of uh, how these features evolved. Well, at some point or other, there was a standing body of water and a standing body of ice. And that might have been there for quite a few million years. Now it does appear as if there is a connection between the erosion that took place through the main channel and water that appeared in these craters, which kind of suggests rain of some kind, or at least snow. So we have all the ingredients. We have standing bodies of water, uh, and we have precipitation events, and we have erosion, which leads to sediment forming in the sources. So um, how do we put all of this together? And um, I wanted to mention uh, NASA have an initiative uh, that's been going for 30 years, more than 30 years probably, called the Regional Planetary Imaging Facility. There isn't one here, I don't believe, in San Francisco. There's one down in JPL, and there's one in Arizona, and there's one at Brown University and various other places. Well, we have the first one outside of the US. I just wanted to point this out. Um, because of the fact that uh, we're across the pond, and although the network is a wonderful thing, it's not a terribly wonderful thing when you have four gigabyte size files that you want to download. You know, so two movies a night, so to speak. Uh, and uh, there are thousands and thousands of these high rise one meter or 25 centimeter imagery. So we've set up a mirror in, in uh, London, well, in my lab, uh, for all of this data. And in central London, we now provide specialist 3D analysis and digitization facilities, which people from all across the UK and Europe use. There's now an equivalent system at USGS uh, Flagstaff as well. So in uh, my lab, we have a, a large cluster, um, uh, a large RAID storage, not, of course, large in comparison to a Google farm, but large for a university research group. Um, and. Uh, <coughs> We have at the moment a one gig link going up to 100 gigs. And in central London, uh, we have these 3D facilities that allow people, not quite walking off the street, but certainly close to walking off the street to go and make their own 3D models. And I'll just so an example of one of my colleagues, uh, Pete Grinrod, uh, in, uh, it is supposed to be sciences, um, UCLA Sciences and Center for Planetary Sciences, uh, and he's made uh, these 20 3D models of uh, various different regions around. Uh, and he's particularly interested in perchlorates. And so uh, he's been looking at areas that he believes that perchlorates play an important role. So one final uh, point to note is um, that uh, this technology has been very expensive. It costs about $50,000 for a stereo workstation for the hardware and the, and the software with a annual uh, maintenance fee of, of the order of $25,000 from BAE systems. So 
we've been trying to find ways that we can make one for under $500. So um, <clears throat> the first thing is for the output display, uh, we have a geo wall, which uh, is just a large screen, which is silver polarized, and a, and a pair of um, very high luminance projectors with circular polarization of different kinds um, that we can project. Uh, and we also have some plane displays, but these are $10,000 a kick. So fortunately, uh, that the professionals might use. But it does mean that we now have the ability to display any stereo pair in 3D. And it does mean that every one of us can uh, become a consumer of this 3D technology. We can do it ourselves. We don't necessarily have to wait for NASA JPL or the PDS system or whatever. And it does make a huge difference now for the interpretation with some basic core level um, drivers from JPL called the JDIS library uh, for graphic hardware and platform independence uh, and allows you to make uh, 3D models. Uh, <coughs> it allows you to view a scene. Uh, I'm not sure if I can switch to another application here, so I'll just keep going. Um, and um, allows you to do uh, the stereo visualization and allows you to produce 3D models like this uh, and display them. So we've now uh, essentially popularized the technology and made it available for anyone to use. SourceForge is where the stereo workstation uh, can be found or the stereo viewer can be found if you want to find it yourself. Um, but <coughs> There's one thing left we need to be able to do in order to uh, go back to the core objective, which is the life detection. And that is we need to be able to fuse between uh, what we see from space with what we see on the ground. So we need to be able to much better understand if we're looking from space at the surface, where are the target areas where life might be lurking? Um, and be able to do that, we need to be able to create on-demand 3D visual products of these places based upon the best available image and the 3D data. So we've, we've done that. Um, I'm not going to go through this in, in any kind of detail, but I'll just show you an example from uh, the Mer Spirit. Uh, and in this particular case, we want to be able to fuse images taken on the ground with images taken from space. So we have some issues because there are large scale uh, and viewpoint differences. And it's not tri trivial uh, to actually look at something from above and then try to work out what it looks like from the ground. Um, and so the approach that we've adopted is to actually uh, produce images from the rover that make it look like it's from space. Seems a pretty obvious thing to do. Um, and then uh, here's an example. Uh, where we take uh, a bit of a picture from high rise um, and then we uh, produce these mosaics, these panoramas, uh, as if viewed from above. Uh, <coughs> we then, this just talks about the actual technical details, which I'm not going to talk about too much. Um, and the final end result of all of this is that we have fused the two together in order to make uh, from the satellite image, shows another region, a fusion from the ground level panorama and the spaceborne image. So here uh, we have an example. Uh, this has been done with lots of tender loving care by my colleague Ron Lee at Ohio State University. Um, I was showing you some examples earlier of uh, automated application for spirit. This is opportunity. Uh, but it does now mean uh, that we can go uh, between the two different views and potentially synthesize the view that we see on, on the basis of the spaceborne image to what we might be able to see from the ground. Because ultimately that's what we want in order to be able to decide, are we really going to go there? And of course we are going to have to do this uh, with MSL Curiosity. We need to make sure, even if it takes us a year to get to Mount Sharp, we need to make sure that we're going to look at the right places. And unlike what happened with Mer, we've got this fantastic 25 centimeter imagery from space in order to be able to do that. So that describes how we use 3D and how we use stereo. 
in order to help us with looking for habitable places. Now let's look at uh, the greater prize, which is um, that of how we might detect actual life itself. So let's start with uh, how do we add, uh, and for all of this, we're going to use the 3D just like we do on the Earth for making maps. Okay, they're in the computer now, but it's a map. And it's all correctly geometrically formatted. And so I can overlay whatever data I get from whatever s platform or sensor. And it's all stacked on top of each other. I don't need to worry about. Because that's a major problem at the moment with NASA data. You can't take some data from Viking and some data from uh, Mars Global Surveyor and just lay one over the other because they don't match with each other. So the 3D is an important part of that. Most important instrument uh, for this uh, is the uh, NASA CRISM instrument and the European Space Agency OMEGA instruments. And uh, these take data, uh, and they take data in lots and lots of different spectral planes. So this is a spectral cube, um, and uh, each one of these planes is a different spectral wavelength. In the case of CRISM, every 10 nanometers. In the case of some of the instruments I'm going to show you uh, later on that we've been developing in our lab, one and a half nanometers. So it doesn't really matter, but essentially the principle is the same. And so uh, we have a spacecraft with a gimbal mount that allows us to uh, look at the same spot on the ground from various different angles. The Omega provides you the global reconnaissance and the CRISM multispectral provides you slightly higher resolution on the order of 100 meters. And then the CRISM hyperspectral provides you right down at the 15 to 30 meter. And we have versions around the Earth. So we can do our studies in desert regions or in Antarctica or in Svalbard or HMP, wherever, uh, because we have instruments like the European Space Agency's medium resolution imaging spectrometer, the compact high resolution imaging spectrometer, and NASA's uh, Hyperion EO1. So we can develop methods, we can do the tests, and then we can compare them against the results we get from CRISM of Mars. So what's been determined, for example, is these show little vignettes with the uh, hyperspectral data superimposed uh, on one of the uh, CTX images, is that, um, and this shows another example, uh, you can extract what has a large amount of iron, what has a large amount of mafic, what has a large amount of clay. And a recent study that we've done, uh, and this is something I've wanted to talk to Adrian about, uh, is um, we found that uh, around the South Pole uh, of Mars, uh, we appear to have huge quantities of uh, um, organic material that um, uh, <coughs> is similar to what has been found on some of the satellites of Saturn and Jupiter. But something I'd like to point out is there is one enormous gap in this spectrum due to the instrument, not due to a conspiracy by NASA, uh, due to the instrument. And that is the gap between uh, 640 and 700 nanometers. Unfortunately, that is exactly the region we'd like to look at for chlorophyll fluorescence. But it isn't a conspiracy. It is just unfortunate. Uh, that there is a gap in that area. So uh, a number of people have looked at this, and uh, um, Kang from uh, Goddard's uh, uh, Institute of Space Studies um, has looked at in particular. Uh, this is a, a, a spectrum of, uh, this is wavelength along the x-axis here, from 200 to 2,000, uh, uh, 2,400 nanometers. And the blue line here is what we see as the irradiance, the incoming radiation, spectral irradiance coming into the Earth. And these lines here are associated with what we see on the surface. What's been absorbed is water uh, has absorbed it. Carbon dioxide uh, has absorbed it. Ozone also has absorbed it. And molecular oxygen. What's also shown here is uh, some of the fluorescent features that we see actually from chlorophyll superimposed uh, on this. And in the lower one, uh, what it would look like 20 centimeters below a water surface 
if we had bugs living there, what would the spectral reflectance look like? Now, we already measure on the Earth the color of the water from space. Uh, it is, in fact, a very important component in uh, global fishing, the reason why we're doing such a good job on hoovering out the whole of the Atlantic and at the moment moving over to the Pacific. But basically, it is because we're able to detect how much chlorophyll there is uh, in phytoplankton. And phytoplankton, one version of phytoplankton, are bacteria, cyanobacteria. So we're already able to detect half a percent of the signal uh, that we receive at the top of the atmosphere in terms of the color of the surface. Now, when we're looking at microbial chlorophyll uh, over uh, ice regions, we're looking at 100 times less signal. But that is just a matter of the technology of the sensitivity of the detectors themselves. Uh, that's nothing to do with, uh, you know, it's certainly uh, well within our technological grasp. So, what can we do uh, from space with such hyperspectral imaging for life detection? Well, as I say, there is this missing region, so we can't really look for chlorophyll, and we can't look for phycocyan. Um, but uh, Skytoneman, if I pronounce that correctly one day, uh, that does appear to have a characteristic signature. And of course, the other question is, what can we do in the future? Now, you're probably aware that uh, MSL has the mask cam, it has a color camera. Um, and of course, what colors did they choose? Did they choose colors to make it look good on TV? Or did they choose colors because they could detect particular types of rock? I'm going to answer that question a little later on. Uh, <clears throat> what we're trying to do with the ESA XMRs pan cam uh, is actually make color imagery um, on the basis of what are the signals that we're trying to measure. So not just, we're also going to make nice colored pictures for the TV, but in addition to that, we'll have a number of bands that we look at. So we've been developing um, two different approaches to doing this hyperspectral imaging. We can't use this kind of system in space because it's sequential. It's a tunable filter. Um, and it takes a certain amount of time uh, on the order of microseconds uh, for each individual band, but it takes uh, to move from one wavelength to another by adjusting radio frequencies. Um, it takes too long, and meanwhile the satellite has moved seven kilometers down orbit. So we can't use it from space, but we could certainly use it on the ground, because every time the rover takes a picture now, the rover stands perfectly still. The rover does not take pictures while it's moving because otherwise you'd just see lots of blurred pictures. Um, so it doesn't really matter if it stays stationary. So this is my colleague, uh, Andrew Griffiths, uh, who is the uh, PANCAM uh, project scientist, camera scientist, and um, also was the Beagle 2 camera scientist. And here he is with uh, Bridget. Uh, this is the um, Astrium UK Bridget. Uh, that's the rover, uh, the name of the rover, um, in a field uh, campaign in September last year. And on that, uh, we had uh, two cameras that uh, mimic the XMR's PANCAM camera, and we had our own uh, hyperspectral imaging system that I'm now going to describe. So this is HyperCam Mark I, known as HC1. Uh, and uh, the characteristics of uh, the system are we have two different uh, tunable filters, one of which runs from the blue uh, to the near infrared, and the other one runs from the red into the shortwave infrared. Uh, and you can see the integration times. Uh, I'm not going to go dwell on the uh, transmission curves. Um, <laughs> but uh, this all took place in a Mars analog site. Uh, this is in a uh, volcanic cauldron in Tenerife, where they've been having terrible fires the last two weeks. Um, and we're about to do another campaign there, and we hope the fires go out before then. But um, <coughs> we've been looking in a number of these different regions, uh, and um, you can see that what the characteristics of these regions look like. So this is the HyperCam system, uh, actually mounted on the stereo bar uh, on the Aberystwyth University's Pan-Tilt unit. And through the magic of machine vision and photogrammetry, 
we are able to automatically fuse uh, not just the stereo pictures into 3D points, but also fuse the hyperspectral imagery so we know exactly where every single pixel is and we know what its orientation is as well. So um, this has been done. I'll show you an example uh, which we did only two weeks ago in uh, a location in Wales which contains a lot of extremophiles. And um, here's Hypercam 2. The difference here now is that it's 1.4 nanometer spectral sampling, no longer 10 or 20. Uh, but it's over a more limited uh, wavelength region. Now, uh, it is scientists in Moscow who've developed this uh, acoustic optical tunable filter technology. And uh, they claim that they could use this technology to make a camera that could go from 300 nanometers to 3,000 nanometers with less than one nanometer spectral sampling. Of course, we don't have an imaging device that has that broad spectral range, but we're getting there. Uh, we're getting there with CMOS technology. So this Hypercam 2 uh, was um, also uses a similar kind of uh, interface. And this is an electron multiplied CCD. So it's like a photo multiplier tube. It boosts the signal by a factor of a thousand. And here it is in, uh, in operation in true British style. Uh, we call this a Heath Robinson. This is basically you put together paper and cardboard and uh, you make um, optical devices from it as a test before you actually go to the enormous expense of doing this in our uh, workshop. Um, and the end result of that, and you can have a look, uh, it, it's moving now every few nanometers, and eventually out of the mer murk, you will start to see some gauze uh, flowers emerging. And these are very, very uh, preliminary uh, results, but basically um, the newer system, which is flying on a helicopter, a, a, a model helicopter, shall I say, um, that uh, actually fills the whole field of view rather than just a third of the field of view, but that's what prototypes are about. So anyway, so we have these two new pieces of technology, and that allows us to synthesize any rover instrument, including ones in the past, like MER, and ones in the present, like mask cam, but also ones in the future. Here you can see the strong IR reflectance that you get. So a couple of weeks back, uh, we went to a place called Brecon, which is very pretty. You can see you know, what a countryside looks like. Uh, these rolling hills. And there, there are sites uh, where there are large deposits are just beneath the surface of large microbial communities. So uh, we took along um, our own version of, we have Hypercam 1 Viz and Hypercam 1 IR, and then we wanted to reproduce what we got uh, on a rover uh, at a fraction of the cost. So we looked in the catalog online and we found Extreme Sports HD TV cameras. And they really were, they were beautiful quality cameras, so, uh, called dog cams. Um, and um, <coughs> here is our rover. Uh, we know this in the UK as a tea trolley. But, uh, and in fact, it does belong to our kitchen. We brought it along. Uh, but it worked fantastically well. You know, it did everything that we needed. Uh, <coughs> we were able to, we've got GPS on board. We've got, you know, a, a robust uh, laptop. Uh, and um, we've got all the power sources. Uh, and everything was highly mobile. It was a bit of a, sorry? No, 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 <laughs> it doesn't, no. <laughs> it's a tea trolley, yeah. Um, I, I believe the tea trolley costs about 50 bucks, but you know, so it's, uh, uh, the instrumentation costs about $25,000 to build, so it's, it's considerable more expensive. But the point I want to make is that you can do it uh, nowadays with uh, much more limited resources than we would otherwise. So here's an example of um, some of the, the results. Uh, this is just a superposition of uh, two color uh, images uh, and the corresponding uh, hyperspectral image. Uh, here we see the uh, um, rectified dog cam stereo and the associated uh, visible and near infrared imagery. 
So we can now fuse all of these different uh, data sources together. I'm not going to explain how we did that. But, uh, and we can make them into 3D uh, point clouds um, to be able to look uh, at the region at any particular angle that we want to. And of course, the great advantage here is that we can also take a rock sample with a geologist's hammer, which we still don't have on MSL or XMRs, um, and we can bring the rock back to the lab. And we can do all sorts of studies of a rock, uh, and um, so we actually have ground truth with these data. So, looking back at uh, how we're going to use this data and how it has been used in the past, I want to start off by talking about this question of what color bands you're going to uh, use on the various different systems. These shows you the color filters, the central wavelengths, um, and there's a bit of a repeating pattern here if you look across. Um, in fact, someone came up with some filters uh, in 1997 and they thought, thought you know, if someone came along and uh, Beagle in 2003 thought, oh, those look interesting, so we'll use the same ones. Um, and Moor came along and used ones that were pretty identical. In each of these cases, they were the best guess, but they weren't really based upon any quantitative information. So Claire Cousins uh, and co-workers uh, took the hyperspectral imaging system um, in the lab setting, took a variety of different rocks, and then did a detailed statistical analysis of if we're interested in these specific rock types and these specific types of minerals, what is the best wavelength? And in some cases, they are similar, you know, like the blue one at 440, but in other cases, they're quite different to any of the wavelengths on any of the other systems to date. So that's an example of how one can use the hyperspectral. Now, if we had a system that was dedicated to looking for life, you might choose different central wavelengths as well. You might be looking... Uh, for fluorescent signatures as well as for reflectance signatures. So let's talk about life. Uh, another definition of life that Mike Story Lombardi from the Canoe Institute has, uh, which is the laser or the LED induced fluorescent imaging emission. I didn't realize that's what life stood for, but. Uh, and we built an instrument called WALL-E, uh, not to be confused at all with the um, waste uh, loading system from uh, Disney. Pixar, um, and uh, WALL-E is a system for field deployable UV fluorescent imaging. Uh, here is WALL-E, um, and here we can see uh, it has this long nose associated with it, which is light tight, um, and uh, <coughs> it has a standard Fovian Sigma camera, and inside WALL-E there is uh, a ring of um, white light LEDs, you can just about see it here. There's also a whole bunch of UV LEDs. So you go up to a rock, and this is my colleague Lewis Dartnell uh, doing some work that we did together in Tunbridge Wells, uh, which isn't too far away from uh, our lab, with some Cretaceous rocks, uh, pointing it at the rock, getting a light tight seal, taking a white light image, and then immediately afterwards taking a UV image. And what does he see? Well, this is the white light image. This is algae on the rock, and this is the corresponding um, UV fluorescent. And you can see that certain parts of those algae fluoresce in different wavelengths, and they fluoresce in different color regions as well, which is related to the photopigments that they have. Why is this of any interest? Because MSL, on its arm, uh, has an instrument called MALI, uh, that Mark Kenedjit uh, from uh, um, Malian Space Systems is the PI of. And uh, MALI uh, contains a microscope, but it also contains white light and UV LEDs. We're using exactly the same UV LEDs. So we have an opportunity now to take field data with the WALL-E instrument. And at the moment, it's on loan to Kira here at the Mars Institute until she brings it back sometime at the end of the month, so beginning of next month. So finally, the final topic uh, in my remaining four minutes, but I do want to leave lots of time for questions, is um, how do we detect whether or not the bugs might be tens of kilometers below the surface? Well, it was hypothesized by no less a person than James Lovelock, Mr. Gaia. 
uh, that uh, in, in 1967, in this paper, that if methane were detected in Mars atmospheres, it should be a strong indicator of biological activity. Now, ground observations, interestingly, uh, although it was to a certain extent also supported by Mars Express uh, um, PFS measurements, showed that there are highly variable amounts of methane. So it appears to be there for a couple of seasons and then within another season, Martian season of six months, uh, it's gone again. And there was a beautiful instrument, uh, PI by uh, JPL, which is going to be on our combined European NASA ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, which unfortunately, as you know, uh, NASA decided to exit from, um, so it isn't happening. Uh, but we have on the Earth uh, an instrument called Skirmaki, uh, which also makes these types of uh, methane uh, observations. Um, we're beginning to analyze methane, particularly over the Australian continent. So how does this work? Well, we can be able to tell where methane is from weak absorption lines, particularly around 1.6 and 2.1 micron. Uh, but... Um, more interestingly, if we get very, very fine spectral resolution, hundredth or thousandth of a nanometer, we can actually tell if it's a carbon-12 or a carbon-13 molecule. So that allows us to look at abundance ratios of methane and ethane and various other compounds. Um, and that's much more definitive way of being able to tell, does it come from biology, is it biogenic, or does it come, not come from biology, but you know, from the ground? from some geological process associated normally with volcanism. So, once again, Matt Moss could have done the job, but isn't going to. Uh, and another instrument called ACE, uh, Fourier Transform Spectrometer, which is uh, flying uh, today, um, that has already made uh, very interesting measurements of uh, isotopes of uh, hydrogen. And I know work is going on at the moment with methane and CO2. Chlorophyll fluorescence, you can also potentially see uh, from orbit. But as I said earlier, uh, okay, you can map uh, the chlorophyll fluorescence from vegetation on the Earth or from uh, bugs that live in the water, uh, but that's a whole different ballgame to uh, what we see on Mars. So, in my final minute, uh, I'm, I would like to go to a demo, um, but I'll just give a brief outline. We've developed a system that allows us to take all the various different inputs over an area, so from space and from the ground, from a rover, and allow you to view them and process them and combine them together into one coherent, co-registered data set. We call this Progis. Um, Progis happens to be a trademark, so we have this progisweb.eu, uh, which you can go visit yourself, and uh, allows you to... Uh, point to a particular target location, find out where the uh, rover was looking, uh, find out um, what uh, images uh, the rover took, um, look at one particular image pair, uh, look at it uh, also in stereo, uh, and if there is time afterwards, I'd be happy to demonstrate it online. Um, and finally, uh, I'm just 20 seconds over now, so what are the challenges and opportunities for the future? Well, one of the things, of course, we would like to be able to do uh, is you know, it's very, very expensive. There are hundreds of people at the moment working furiously in Mars time down at JPL running the MSL Curiosity program. It's very expensive in terms of uh, salaries, but it's also very expensive in terms of people's time, even you know, a large number of volunteers. Um, we need to have fully automated systems. We need to have autonomous navigation. We need to have science target selection. So what we're doing is we are trying to make the building blocks for how we do that autonomous science. And as part of an EU Framework 7 project, um, we have a demonstrator next month, and this rover needs to perform on its own, driving around the cauldron in Tenerife. The control room will be two kilometers away. 
and the rover has to go and find some science targets which happen to have been put into the environment. But, you know, there's still, uh, <coughs> it's a starting point. Another aspect of this is uh, we need to be able to go to near Earth, but from the air. And so Aerobot systems is something that uh, we're looking at, and in particular developing a system in Australia um, that would allow us to do the hyperfine hyperspectral. But what we want to show with MSL is how we can now exploit this technology to decide on where we should look and how we can demonstrate quantitatively uh, what we can gain as a result of using the 3D combined with the, the spectral. So specifically, the group uh, will be starting a new project with eight other partners in a new project called Provide. We have Provis G, Provis Scout, it's now Provide. Planetary Robotics Vision for Data Exploitation. And there we plan to take all of the MER data, all the imaging data, non-imaging data, and put it into one single coherent, fully immersive 3D web GIS and also demonstrate these tools uh, for MSL and XMRs. I'm, of course, very interested because there's another opportunity for funding. Uh, and NASA have said that they will match funding. Um, to look here at SETI and also at the Mars Institute, JPL are already on board in ProvisG and Provis Scout, but I see no reason why we shouldn't have other organizations, in particular, uh, more associated with astrobiology. And in the long term, the opportunities are I believe in what I've already previously mentioned, the acoustic optical tunable filter system that will allow us to look at all of these different spectral elements, including fluorescence. Thank you all for your patience and understanding. Peter, can I just kick off the questions with um, the, the stereo coverage that you were showing earlier in the talk from HRSC? Uh, is that you were saying it was 47% of Mars is covered at the moment. Is there uh, an uh, estimate of how much will be covered in the next couple of years? I mean, I'm, and what's the state of HRSC now? How long will it keep operating? Um, well, the PI is about to retire, yeah. Gerhard Neuken, uh, and, uh, but the whole operation is still being run successfully by the German Space Agency. So at the moment, there's enough fuel on board Mars Express to keep going till 2017. If it continues uh, going that long, it will be possible to get 100% coverage of Mars okay. in stereo. The money, however, the German government has spent on making the 3D models, which will be made manually with some degree of automation, that will take uh, considerably longer than that. And at the moment, we only have individual strips. They're not all tied together in one uniform. This is one of the things we want to look at right. uh, with this um, new uh, European Union framework program. Right, OK. I'm interested in all of the technologies. Um, but the one that I'll ask about is the merging, the, the fusing of the imagery. I'm imagining that you might have uh, sort of uh, moderate resolution 3D and then a high resolution image underneath and you want to register and overlay. But then I was thinking, is there um, an iterative loop where you then can actually use the imagery to fill in details of the 3D and, you know, to by having to do the angle of the radiation and all of that stuff? Yeah, um, I, I, I didn't discuss that at all, but... Uh, I, I showed an example, uh, and if I can get to it fast enough, um, because there are lots of slides. Come on. <laughs> Might have been a little quicker to scroll in the other view. Almost there. Ah, that's the one I wanted. Okay, that's exactly what we do here. We start with uh, the laser altimetry data. The laser altimetry data provides us with the 3D framework. We use that data to, to tell us 
what plane the image data is in. We then have linked the HRSC stereo to the molar data, which is, provides us with the global framework. We pick out features in the CTX. We link those to the ones in the HRSC. We pick out features in high rise. We link those to the ones in CTX. And in the paper that we, we describe how we do this, so we have this cascade already of co-registered multiple resolution. But I think your question was more that stereo doesn't always work because some areas are featureless, too little texture, uh, and some areas would just not match because the viewpoints are too distorted. The obvious example being from an aircraft. Sometimes you see the top of the building, and sometimes you see the top on the side, so nothing you can do about it. Now, there are techniques, shape from shading in particular, is, uh, are the ones, but so far no one has successfully, that I'm aware of, combined the two things together. Because the way that we do the stereo, which is an area-based way, we could do the shape from shading on the fly while we're doing the stereo. We just haven't succeeded in doing it yet. Uh, I think that is a way to go in the future because obviously the stereo provides you with rigid 3D locations and the shape from shading provides you with somewhat fluid and flexible uh, locations. And one of the founders of uh, shape from shading used to teach at Stanford University in um, AI, Binford, I think his name was. Uh, and so uh, I know that there's been, you know, 40 years of work in that area, but nobody's so far successfully done that. Okay. Um, this is really interesting work. I'm a scientist here at the SETI Institute, and I do um, stereo imaging, and among other things. So we've got a socket set workstation upstairs. Um, we've recently been benchmarking that um, because it, the, because of the same issues that you saw, where it's very expensive, um, both hardware and software, to use socket set. So we've been benchmarking that with something called AIM Stereo Pipeline. Have you heard of that? So it's an open source stereo imaging system. Um, and so we've actually seen some really encouraging results that we have um, very comparable, you know, there's there's some things that socket set can do really well um, in terms of the, the the delicate kind of, a, you know, by hand adjustment of the DTM that you can't do with a more automated open source technique. Uh, but we've been very encouraged with what we've seen um, sort of comparing these two techniques. So I was interested to see whether you had, um, you had done similar benchmarking with your, your, your new kind of homebrew stereo system with socket set. Uh, we have, and uh, not only with socket set, but in fact with 12 other systems. There's a paper published in Planetary Space Science specifically on HRC DTMs, where a number of US groups, a number of groups in Europe, uh, but n unfortunately uh, we did uh, invite the people from Ames, but at that point in time they were just starting the project, so they haven't been sufficiently developed. And uh, one of the things that came out of that is how do you make sure that when you have an evaluation done by one of the competing parties that it is indeed objective enough? Uh, and it is difficult because there are various criteria you can set in terms of accuracy, but we can't send surveyors to the surface of Mars yet uh, to actually give you the truth. So you are, to a large extent, still judging that on the basis of quality of visual aesthetic, you know, which one gives you the finest detail, which one has the lowest number of artifacts. And, and the way that we came up with was actually which one is best at being able to measure the largest number of crater features, for example, in the 3D model rather than the original image. But that's a rather indirect way of doing that. And also I had another just comment about your filters. Um, I've done a lot of work comparing um, say that within the outer solar system, for example, comparing images taken by later spacecraft like Galileo with older data from spacecraft like Voyager. And so just a warning when you're thinking about optimizing future filters for, you know, the perfect wavelengths to detect certain rocks, what you lose is that backward compatibility. And so it's been a, a continued frustration that the Voyager and the Galileo filter sets are totally different. And then if you bring in Cassini, that's a totally different filter set. So there is something to be said for having that backward compatibility. Yeah, well, the solution to that, from my perspective, of course, would be to have hyperspectral systems throughout, and then you wouldn't have to worry about the filter set. But the trouble is that we have these uh, extremely difficult problems of bandwidth. Uh, and e given the enormous pressure that the deep space network is under and the European equivalent, we just can't get enough data back. 
emptying of the front row. <laughs> With the merging of different uh, camera systems from different points of view, how do you make sure that you have absolute coordinate matching? What do you do to uh, ensure from frame to frame from the different systems that their uh, geographic coordinates do match each other? Is it done manually or can it be done automatically? Uh, there, there are two different approaches. Uh, one of them is uh, that one system uh, you have firm belief and you have um, objective criteria demonstrate that it has the best at the moment geo-referencing information. And what we have at the moment is that the HRC one has an absolute geo-referencing uh, accuracy of the order of 25 meters. So we can make that the base and then everything else that we register to that, which we can do automatically with feature points. And there, e even in very old Viking orbiter images, you know, after you remo remove the fiducial marks and everything else, there's still enough feature points to allow you to do that. So the other way we do it is um, there's a technique developed in photogrammetry over a very long time period called bundle adjustment that allows you to take multiple views. Uh, and if you find the corresponding tie points in all of these multiple views, is it improves the precision of the intersecting rays between all of these multiple views. So least squares, adjustment done on, on all the individual camera viewpoints. Automatically or manually? Uh, automatically, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, mapping companies, photogrammetric mapping companies, and we see their fruits every day on Google Earth or Google Maps, you know, or, or even Bing, no doubt. Um, uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, it does work. It does work uh, automatically. Now, there is another problem, though, which is worth mentioning, uh, uh, and that is the problem uh, of angle that you're looking at the surface. Now, the, the surface of Mars, uh, like the surface of the Earth, does reflect light differently depending upon what angle you're looking at it and also what is the angle of the illumination. That can be quite problematic uh, when you're at uh, close range, and particularly when you're trying to take pictures taken with one particular sun angle and then pictures taken from another sun angle. Yeah, uh, to actually fuse those together. Now we don't, uh, that all relates back to the question about shape from shading. Uh, you need to know that in order to do the shape from shading, which is a, not a problem. Uh, but at this point in time, to fuse all of these things together into one geometrically uh, constant framework, I don't think is an issue anymore. Yeah, I have a chemistry-related question. Um, in one of your early slides, you mentioned tryptophan as a possible target compound. Uh, generally, the heterocyclic aromatics have interesting spectra. Uh, what's your ability to detect these things? Can you get down to parts per billion, parts per trillion? I can't tell you yet because the tryptophan system that we're developing for hospital applications actually uh, mm -hmm. is um, still being developed and we haven't yet done those sensitivity experiments. We have looked at excitation emission matrices to look at the spectrofluorescence of it but we don't yet know uh, what is the lower limit that we can detect with current sensor technology. Hmm. So you're looking for fluorescence rather than infrared absorption. Correct. Yes, I mean, there are ways that we could, you know, as I say, our ideal system would allow us to go into the shortwave infrared and possibly into the mid-infrared because we'd see a lot more features there, but we're not, we're not doing that at this point. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Peter for his great talk today. Thank you.